Abandoned by his family after a tragic accident which caused him to lose his mother and the use of his right hand, a young 14-year-old maiden shows up at his door to marry him and bring him out of his darkness. It all started inside the wealthy and powerful Shima family. A boy named Tamihiko Shima is blessed with a great fortune, but he just wants nothing more but affection from his family. However, the day came when he got into an accident with his mother, and unfortunately, she died. After his father found out that he couldn't be able to use his right hand anymore, he calls him a good-for-nothing son, and his siblings just wished that he should have died instead of their mother. Since he failed to meet his father's expectations, he was sent to their hidden villa in the mountains of Chiba alone. I couldn't imagine being shoved away so as not to bring shame upon the name of my family. That must have been hard for him. Every night, he couldn't sleep because his intrusive thoughts kept him from doing so. He had dark circles around his eyes, and he thought that it would be easier to never wake up at all. He saw no light to illuminate his way forward, or that was what he thought, until a little girl with red braided hair named Yuzuki Tachibana knocked at his door one evening and introduced herself as his wife. Her pleasant personality and cheerful introduction were, in fact, opposite to Tamahiko's. His father indeed mentioned about giving him a wife to take care of him, although he couldn't see the point of having a wife since he was a handicap. He still welcomed her and put on his coat to her small body, saying that he didn't want her to get cold. That first kindness that he showed to her was her motivation to give back the kindness she received. She then started cleaning the house, cooking breakfast, doing shopping, sewing the holes of his underwear, and even offered to help him wash his face, though he declined it at first. All these still startled him, not used to having someone so determined to show him how they should be taken care of. His dark world slowly started to change in color because of her. One morning as he was taking a bath, she suddenly opened the door and went in to offer him a rinse on his back. He thought of her as just a little girl who knows little of this world. However, she started blurting out about her worries. The first one made him laugh because of her problem with the thickness and waviness of her hair. He didn't laugh at her for her hair, but for the way she thought about her worry. Realizing that he was laughing, he then covered his mouth. That was the first time she saw what he looked like when he laughed. The second one was the problem of her family's finances. She was sold 10,000 yen to cover her family's debt. When she was still in girls' school, she worked twice as hard as everyone else. She was such a mom to her friends, and she was very kind to everyone. Midori, one of her friends whom she talked about her situation, wished her a happy marriage life. The scene escalated to a New Year's Eve party on December 13, 1921. Despite her efforts, it was still too early to change his perspective. His intrusive thoughts were keeping him awake again, and he was trying not to remember it. Suddenly, she came into the room and lit up the woods to provide warmth. She really knows what to do, even though he's secretive of what's going on in his mind. As she was waiting for the milk to simmer, he blurted out his frustrations about the conditions that she would be living under the same roof of a pessimistic man with no future. He created a situation in his head about a girl who would curse her life for taking care of a handicap like him. He wanted her to admit it, but instead she offered him a hot milk to calm him down. She then sang a song that his mother used to sing for his little sister. He then told her the reasons why he couldn't sleep. She got up from her seat and moved him closer to her as she was brushing his hair and slowly patting his shoulder. He wondered why she was so kind to him. She knows what he wants, an affection that he cannot have from his own family. The boy isn't as bad as he thinks of himself. He's a kind-hearted person who just happened to lose hope because of abandonment. She then offered that they should sleep together. Are they going to do that? She admitted that she was still a virgin and has never been in love, but she wanted to save it for him. She wanted to be by his side and to see the different sides of him. She wanted to love him. I know you're thinking about something else. As she grabbed the end cloth of his sleeping robe, he thought that it would be another night with no wink of sleep. Then, his eyes closed. She woke him up and greeted him a happy new year. She then served him with delicious foods. After tasting, he wanted more of it. A pessimist who rejects what the world has to offer slowly accepting the girl's affection. Would he be able to change for love? Are we thinking about the wedding now? In this episode, Otome is defined as a pure and defined maiden who seeks happiness beyond the stars despite being too shy to talk about romance. In the early spring, as they are eating breakfast, a letter from his father arrived. His other siblings are to get married, and if the other families would learn about his son being a handicap, it would ruin their reputation. So, it must be declared that he died in a car accident. 
Yuzuki made him his favorite Hitsumi dumplings, but he just wanted to be left alone. She kept calling his name outside his door, but he yelled at her, which made her sad. Oh man, that hurts. Morning came, and he still didn't leave his room. Still concerned about his health, she delivered food to his room. But then she heard him groaning in pain. She found out that he was having a high fever. In his dream, he was running after his father, but when he tried to touch him, his father smacked his hands, telling him not to touch him. His father even told him that his siblings were barely suffering from his death to make up a story. For his father, he was already dead because he could not live up to his expectations. He suddenly woke up telling Yuzuki that he should just die for real because it was what his father and siblings wanted. He laughed while thinking about how he should do the deed. She held his face and slapped both cheeks at the same time. As he was fighting the urge to cry, she silenced his lips with her finger. She told him to just let it out, and as he rested on her chest while she was rubbing his back, he let out a painful cry. He then wrapped his arm around her back. Wait, that was what? He did what? When he woke up from draining all his energy crying, he looked for her in the house. He found her in the kitchen, singing and cooking. He was looking for her because he wanted to sleep with her in the room. She did the forehead to forehead thing to see if his fever had gone down. This made him shocked and embarrassed. As she put on a coat over his shoulders, he then told her that they should go to Tokyo to make amends for ruining her kimono, even though she did not complain about it. As they arrived there, she was amazed of the city's large area, as well as the infrastructures, and how people dressed. Being rich, as he was, he told her to pick new clothes from a store. Unable to pick which one is best, she asked him, but he just said that they should buy both since money wasn't a problem. She kept thanking him all the way. After hearing that the stained kimono was the first cloth she sewn, he felt bad, but she told him that the new fabric would be the first one that her lover and husband ever bought her. In time, it would be precious to her all throughout her life. She's very sentimental, and she takes good care of things that are given to her. She was thinking that these fabrics were to be passed down to their daughter or granddaughter one day. He was embarrassed again, wondering how she could say it without even blushing. Why are you thinking about babies, Yuzuki? Take it slow. As they arrived at the escalator, she got nervous to step in, given that she grew up far from the city. On their way, she spotted a couple eating an ice cream. She then looked at him with a drooling face with glinting eyes. She's not used to the city's privileges. That's why these things become so special to her. As she started eating, she leaned forward and told him to eat up the ice cream on the spoon she was holding. But then the elderly couple at the opposite table called them vulgar for displaying public affection. He was glad that she enjoyed herself in Tokyo. Suddenly, he was distracted by the couple treating their son with ice cream. He remembered how he used to alone when he was younger. His intrusive thoughts of his father calling him dead came to mind. She noticed his reactions and offered to go home early even though she had not finished her ice cream yet. As they were heading home inside a train, she opened up about telling her parents that they should think of her as dead before leaving. She explained that it did not necessarily mean dead for real, but just a sign that she would never see them again. He realized that she was very optimistic, and what she said pointed out to that truth. She pretended to fall asleep and rested on his side, which made him embarrassed. But then she said that she would always be beside him. He's slowly trusting her words. Now he's not dealing with traumas alone. A month later, she finished making the kimono and asked him how she looked. For a moment, he was stunned. She teased him that he was captivated. This made his entire face blushed as he denied it. Suddenly, his little sister Tamako, who was mean to him, disturbed the moment. She realized that her older brother seemed to be enjoying his life unlike before when they were still in their mansion. She then asked his servants to put her things inside the villa. He argued with his sister that the villa belonged to him, but she told him that he doesn't own anything since he was proclaimed dead with an evil grin on her face. Will this be another problem for Tamahiko and Yuzuki? <laughs> Let's find out. As his sister continued to mock him for being incapable of living a normal life due to his condition, the servants who carried her things were paid 10 yen for the service. Her attention was then diverted to Yuzuki's height, which is compared to a primary school pupil. Yuzuki was shocked to know that his sister was only 12 years old, but was taller than her. She promised to become taller than her in a year. He told his sister to show respect for his betrothed because of the age gap. However, his sister would not respect someone who looked like a child. As soon as his sister found a suitable room, Yuzuki prepared to settle her things inside. She was shocked to see how strong and accommodating Yuzuki was to ensure that everything was in place. In the kitchen, he explained to Yuzuki about his sister's behavior way back in their mansion. She was the most intelligent among the Shima family, but always the quiet one who preferred to isolate herself. 
However, Yuzuki still wanted to be friends with her. Tamako entered the kitchen and declined Yuzuki's idea of having a welcome party. He then asked her again what the reason was for why she came to the villa, but she didn't give an exact answer. Instead, she told Yuzuki to bring her food in her room because she wouldn't want to share table with his brother. He lowered his head and told Yuzuki the same thing. As soon as he went back to his room, his sister thought that her brother really hated her that much. Perhaps she doesn't hate him at all. Morning came and Yuzuki told him to walk with her because she had something to show him. On their way to a spring just above their villa, he was amazed to see the beautiful scenery that he hadn't appreciated before. They stopped at a grand tree with an Inari statue or a tree hollow shrine that was believed to be a guardian deity of the mountain like a fairy tale. He smiled as he thought of the same thing and she was glad to see that side of him. They proceeded to the spring where she drank the cold and delicious taste of water. He couldn't drink with one hand, so she offered her hands full of water instead. He was hesitant at first, but as soon as he drank it, Yuzuki blushed as his tongue tickled her palms. Before, he thought of his world as just full of winter, but someone just blew the darkness to who knows whereas he looked at the view of spring in the mountain. He thought of her as the spring storm. His sister watched Yuzuki preparing for the milk caramel and asked how she just did things for someone with no hatred. Yuzuki was just happy to tell her that her body would just move on her own. His sister thought of her as weird. The reason why Yuzuki made milk caramels so was that he could have something to eat while reading. As soon as he tasted it, he told her that it has a warm waist on his mouth. His sister then threw the candy given by Yuzuki, saying that it was just a wad of sugar. I can sense that his sister is jealous of Yuzuki because of how close she is to him, something that they don't share as siblings. It was raining late at night when Tamako had flashbacks of how she had explained to her father that her older sister was bullying her. Her father just told her that he was busy and had no time for nonsense. He gave money to one of their servants in order to deal with her. She's thinking that no one's going to help her, even her dad, huh? Growing up, she developed an attitude that wasn't welcoming to other people. Even in the girl's school, where she attended, people would talk behind her back. Thunder kept rumbling louder, and Tamako went to Yuzuki's room to accompany her in going to the lavatory, but she was just afraid of thunderstorms. As they were walking, an even louder thunderclap happened, which left Tamako to pee on her shorts. She was at the verge of crying, but Yuzuki knew what to do. She grabbed her and told her to soak herself in the water. She too was wondering why Yuzuki was being kind to her, despite what she did earlier to the candies. Yuzuki offered that they should sleep together in a room because of the thunderstorms. Tamiko told her that when she told her father about quitting school because of the insensitivity of the other girls, her father got furious. She couldn't stand being at home, so she went to the villa where her brother resided. She instilled in her mind that dependence should just lead her to get hurt, so she would rather live alone. Yuzuki told her that if she were her sister, she wouldn't make her feel lonely. Yuzuki held her hand, saying that she would be glad if Tamiko called her older sister, despite the height difference. A loud thunderclap startled Tamiko again, and Yuzuki reassured her that it was just a sign that spring was coming. Ever since that night, Yuzuki and Tamiko were getting along with each other, which confused Tamahiko. Despite the confusion, he was amazed to see his younger sister happy. It wasn't a bad episode after all. It was a very hot day when Tamahiko was reading a book. Although tired from all the housework, Yuzuki took time to fan him. As she was about to grab some barley tea, she fainted a little and landed on his dominant hand. <laughs> he told her that he couldn't support her at the very least. When she was feeling better, she went to get some tea, but she collapsed once again. Tomohiko and his sister found her lying on the floor, so she carried her, but he insisted. He was insulted by his sister about him being a handicap, unable to carry Yuzuki with one hand. Tamako went to bring a doctor back in the villa while her brother was struggling to bring water with just a hand. However, as soon as she got back home, she went to the well and brought back some water. Guilty of his incapabilities to help, he gave the doctor some money for the consultation of medicine, but then the doctor told him about his family's bad reputation on looking down on people just by giving them money. The doctor added that Yuzuki was overworked. He accused Tamahiko for running her ragged from morning till night. The bad habit of his family in treating servants poorly fell on his shoulders. His sister heard what the doctor said, so she escorted them out. She got mad for not saying anything back to them when they were so shameful about him. Tamahiko locked himself in a room, scared that one day he may have lost Yuzu, just like his right hand. As soon as Yuzuki woke up feeling better, 
She explained to Tamako that she must stay by his side, watch over him, and believing that one day he would change his pessimistic view of life to a happier heart. Tamahiko went to her room to check up on her, but she couldn't breathe because of the tight bandages around her chest. She asked Tamako to remove it, but she was in the bath. Tamahiko had no choice but to cut it with scissors. To his surprise, Yuzuki had a big chest, which she used to cover with bandages because it made her look fat. To him, he was just making things harder for her. He wanted to break the relationship because he couldn't support her well. However, she buried his face on her chest and reassured him that she wouldn't leave. Once again, he fell asleep next to her. Morning came and Yuzuki woke him up. He insisted that she should rest for another day, but she held his hand to get up for breakfast. At that very moment, he felt a squeezing grip in his heart, and he realized that he wanted to make her happy. Meanwhile, Tamako wanted to become a doctor, so she would be going home by the next morning. What is this about? Why so sudden? Surprised by her sudden decision, Tamahiko wouldn't agree of her leaving. Yuzuki asked her why. She explained that she wanted to be of service to others, which is far from the notion of her family's nature. One afternoon, Tamahiko sat down beside his sister and thanked her for coming to the villa. Yuzuki joined the conversation and suggested that they would all sleep together in a room. Tamako was half asleep when her brother patted her on the head as a sign of compassion. He told her that she was the only family member he cherished the most. Morning came, and they sent Tamako with foods and books as their way of supporting her in becoming a doctor. Back at the villa, Yuzuki brought tea to Tamahiko as he was about to study. He was inspired by his sister's determination to work hard. She remembered that it was market day, so she decided to go to the village. However, he went after her. As suspected, all eyes were on her. But as they were walking, he noticed that she was smiling. She was happy to shop in the market with him again since Tokyo. She bought stationaries for a friend in girls' school named Midori and for Tamako. Meanwhile, he bought the latest versions of books he wanted to read. However, an unknown woman who was observing them suddenly smiled. I have a bad feeling of who this woman might be. Yuzuki cooked a lot of various foods that he liked because she remembered that it was his birthday. He cried as she gave him a pressed bellflower bookmark as a gift since he liked to read books a lot. No one had ever given him a present or even remembered his birthday but her. Hearing words such as happy birthday made him the happiest as though his inner child found salvation. He hugged her tightly and thanked his always and forever treasure, referring to Yuzuki. But realizing it, he took back his words and pointed out the bookmark. A sound of glass breaking startled them both. She thought it was just Haru, the cat, but as he went into his room, he found a woman who broke the glass of caramels and was reading his books. This woman was the one smiling creepily in the town when they were shopping. The woman introduced herself as someone who lives in the village. She seemed to be interested in his liking of books. She tried to seduce him just to steal his wallet, but the bookmark was stolen too. As soon as he realized that she had stole the bookmark, he went after her with a bicycle. Back in the room, Yuzuki smelled the faint scent of a woman. Confusion was drawn to her face as he went off at the time they should be eating together. Will he be able to get it back? Tamahiko successfully followed the girl. Inside a house near the village, a drunk man who happened to be the thief's father slapped him as she complained about stealing someone else's money just for alcohol. The woman had three younger brothers. As soon as her father got a hold of the money, she tried to get it back for her brother's food. The abusive father continued to hurt the woman. This triggered Tamahiko's trauma within the family so he went straight to his room, which confused Yuzuki after cleaning the broken jar and replacing it with a new one. During breakfast, Tamahiko was so determined to get back the bookmark that he acted coldly to Yuzuki. He went to the girl's house again and asked for the bookmark, but on one condition. He should teach the woman's little brother with mathematics first before giving it to him. At the end of the day, the children thanked him for the lessons, and it made him blush to be called sensei. As she was about to hand the bookmark, her drunk father just got home. She promised to give it back later so that her father wouldn't beat him. Unable to retrieve the bookmark, he went straight to bed again. Yuzuki stared sadly at the foods she prepared for dinner. Morning came and he didn't have a wink of sleep. Suddenly, the woman visited the house only to tell lies about her as his mistress. She mocked Yuzuki as an object that was bought by money. He defended Yuzuki. This made the woman irritable, so she made up stories about him being thrilled to see her naked body. What shattered Yuzuki the most was when the woman told her that he gave her the bookmark. She felt betrayed and shattered, so she ripped the bookmark into pieces to settle everything. The next morning, Yuzuki acted like it didn't bother her at all. Tamako called from Kobe to greet Tamahiko happy birthday. She told him about having friends and getting along with them a lot. 
However, he told her the problem. He found out from his sister that in an all-girls school, there was a flower language. The bellflower symbolized unchanging love. He hung up the phone and fit the pieces together. He fell asleep doing it. Yuzuki saw him working hard to attach everything. Yuzuki believed in it being stolen, but she felt terrible and lonely for days that he didn't want to eat with her. She was also jealous of the woman he got friendly with. He just let her pummel him until she was satisfied. After, she told him not to hide things from her, so she would understand. Just like the flower, this couple just handles things maturely. We surely want more of their love story. One morning, as Yuzuki helped Tamahiko to wash his face, a bunch of kids showed up for free lessons. Days passed by and they multiplied into numbers. Such then, the woman who stole the wallet and bookmark came to cook for food. She dragged Yuzuki to the kitchen to prepare for lunch. Yuzuki asked her about Tamahiko and she replied that he liked him. However, she liked how Yuzuki tore down the bookmark to tell her that it won't change her love and trust to Tamahiko. She introduced her name as Ryo. She apologized for what she did, but then again, she teased her to just become a wife while she would be his mistress at the same time. As soon as lunch was served, Tamahiko checked up on Yuzuki. Yuzuki assured that everything was fine. However, Ryo teased her again. Yuzuki and Tamahiko both observed that Ryo had a good heart to children. The children went home and raced to the woods with Ryo. Tamahiko went to his room and wrote something. He seemed serious about it. The following days, Tamahiko was constantly helping Yuzuki with the housework. He fell asleep on her lap out of exhaustion. He woke up to the sound of Yuzu singing outside. He rushed to her and covered her with his coat. That day was Yuzu's 15th birthday, which meant that she was eligible to get married with him any time. At first, he told her that he couldn't marry at the time being and just be a burden to his wife, but he wanted to change. He wrote a letter to his father because he was thinking of attending high school. He told him his plans to find an occupation where he could use his skills. Yuzuki reassured him that she was happy every single day because of his kindness, and she wanted to be by his side forever. She asked him about his feelings, and as soon as the snow fell, he leaned and kissed her. As soon as they realized the situation, they rushed to their rooms because of embarrassment. One morning, as the children went home, a boy named Ryotaro bid farewell for good. He was hired in a shop in Tokyo. The boy wants to study more, but it seems like he has no other option but to earn money. That evening, Ryo came to the villa asking if Ryotaro came by. They split up and searched for him. Ryotaro was the one who saved Ryo when she was about to be taken advantage of by men for money. Yuzuki found the boy inside the storage room. When Tamahiko saw him, he cried, telling them that he didn't want to become a hired man because it would mean that he wouldn't be able to get back home in the village. Tamahiko calmed him down by motivating him to work hard so that he could bring his sisters and brothers to Tokyo. Ryo came in the room crying and hugged him. The following day, they sent Ryotaro off. He promised that he would bring them all to Tokyo. Ryo finally smiled. Tamahiko saw himself being confident because of all the trust that the children had in him. One day, he would be a worthy man to keep Yuzuki safe. Man, I hope Ryotaro will be all right. A letter of good news arrived from Tamahiko's uncle in Kobe proposing to assist him in attending high school. He was so glad that his uncle was willing to help despite the fifth attempt to send a letter of request to his father who never wrote back. Every day he would study and teach the children as well. A newspaper was handed out to Yuzuki containing Kotori Shiratori's, an excellent singer's, arrival in Chiba Station. The children and Yuzuki were all a big fan of Kotori, so they decided to go with Tomohiko. Kotori sang a song in front of everyone at the Chiba Station, which left everyone in awe. As Yuzuki looked at Tomohiko's reaction, she laughed at the unexpected interest of him on her favorite idol. News came the following days that Tomohiko passed the transfer school exam. As soon as he got back to school, all the other boys were amazed by his height. A man named Takaru Shiratori, which happened to be Koratori's twin brother, also transferred in the same school with Tomohiko. As Tomohiko introduced himself, his classmates were unfriendly to him, unlike with Hakaru. Hakaru had a lot of friends, while Tomohiko was all alone. Well, this is because of his sister's reputation as a great single and every single man adored her. It was gym time and Tomohiko was slow in executing the activity. The teacher made all his classmates run again as a joint punishment. His classmates were all complaining about it. Lunchtime, Tomohiko was all alone while Hukaro was invited to the dorm by his classmates. He ate the bento that Yuzu gave him, and it tasted good, but tears rolled down his cheeks because he felt all alone. Hukaru was listening outside the room. It was art class, and the teacher instructed them to draw their loved ones. 
Akaru approached Tomohiko and asked if he could sit beside him. Akaru looked at his drawing and started laughing as soon as Tomohiko signed his work like it was a great masterpiece. He showed him his artwork about his sister Kotori, but it was barely unrecognizable. Both were arguing whose work was worse. Their teacher reprimanded them of their bad artwork and were told to draw each other as a punishment. Tomohiko went home with Akaru to make their assignment. He introduced himself to Yuzuki, who got all excited with Tomohiko bringing a friend at home. Akaru adored Yuzuki's smile, and Tomohiko agreed to him. Tomohiko got up to get more tea because he kept blushing at the thought of Yuzuki's smile. In the kitchen, she asked about school. He lied about having good friends and considerate teachers. Yuzuki was glad to hear all of it. Akaru listened to their conversation. He understood that Tomohiko doesn't want her to worry about him. Okaru noticed Tomohiko's subjects and portraits having cute smiles just like Yuzuki's. Okaru confronted him back in the room about lying to someone just to make them happy. Tomohiko decided to be honest with her, but Okaru insisted that he should turn his lies into truth instead. At dinner, Okaru was glad to have good friends like Tomohiko and Yuzuki. He promised to be back to taste her delicious foods. Tomohiko was confused with the word friends because it was the first time someone wanted to bond with him. Akaru was somehow narcissistic and funny. Tomohiko didn't expect to have a friend like him. Yuzuki was glad to see a happier side of him. Akaru came back to the villa with his twin sister, Kotari, which made Yuzuki panicked. What could have been Katori's intention of visiting Tomohiko and Yuzuki? Katori had been writing in an all-girls magazine about love advice. She was asking Yuzuki for help in order to help troubled girls with their feelings. She thought that Yuzuki could help her make music about it since Akaru told her that the couple were in love with each other. Katori and Yuzuki both shared the same interest in music as they exchanged conversations about it. Tomohiko noticed that Hikaru looked sad and worried. Yuzuki introduced Katori to a new room that she would be using for a while. Katori had a few bars of the music she was about to make. She hummed it and asked for Hikaru's opinion, but he just said that it was nice and went home already. There is really a problem with her twin brother, but I still don't know what. Meanwhile, Yuzuki was on her daily routine of taking care of Tomohiko, and every time she did that, Katori would take down notes as she watched over them. Yuzuki and Tomohiko were uncomfortable of someone constantly staring at them as they do things together. The children of Ryo were outside bringing some goodies. As soon as they spotted Katori, they fawned over her. Tomohiko decided to have a special lesson with Katori about music. The children started singing, but Yuzuki and Ryo joined too. Suddenly, Katori remembered a memory of her twin brother holding a guitar while she sang a song. The day after, Tomohiko's classmate forgot to bring his pencil case. Hikaru leaned over to his back and asked if anyone had a spare pencil. He stuttered while handing out the pencil. His classmate was happy and thanked him. It's always unusual for Tomohiko to have an interaction with people who appreciate his kindness. Okaru told their classmates that Tomohiko lent him the latest version of Juicy Nighttime Club, although he just made it up. Their classmates were all amazed by his interest in such. As they were walking home from school, Okaru asked about Katori in their villa. Katori was getting along with Yusuke and others, but the songwriting seemed to be rough going. Tomohiko invited Okaru over, but he refused. Tomohiko knows that there's something off with Okaru, but he's too good to conceal it. Back in the villa, although Yuzuki made some snacks, Katori seemed to have a lot of trouble with her song. She asked Yuzuki how she met Tomohiko after hitting her head on the wall. Yuzuki was somehow worried when she first got into the villa, but as soon as Tomohiko showed her kindness, she knew from that very moment that he would cherish her. There came a time when she felt uncertainty and confusion. She didn't know when it began, but every time she saw his integrity and awkward kindness, there would always be a feeling of butterflies. Sometimes she couldn't hold back that feeling of wanting him more and of constantly thinking about him. Huh, <laughs> love. Katori decided to combine Yuzuki's feelings and her music. Yuzuki was looking forward to it. She thought of Katori as the one who loved music the most. Katori opened up about her twin brother being the first one to love music. One afternoon, Yuzuki asked Tomohiko how his day in school went. He told Yuzuki that they were reading a book. Yuzuki talked about Hikaru avoiding his twin sister. It wasn't the usual book in the library, but something… I don't want to say it. During lunch break, Tomohiko ate with Hikaru under the shaded area full of trees. Tomohiko asked if there was something wrong with Hikaru and his twin sister. Hikaru decided to tell the whole story. Hikaru was the first person to influence Katori into music. However, he got very sick and had to devote himself into recovery. Given that he couldn't pursue music anymore, he gave his guitar to his sister. Katori refused to accept it, but she had no other choice. After seven years, he fully recovered. By then, Katori became a popular, full-fledged singer. 
She asked him about their promise to sing together again after he would recover but he thought it was exhausting to catch up to her at that moment. Tomohiko could relate to him as he had dismissed himself, but Yuzuki came and opened his heart. Step by step, bit by bit, his world was expanding with more and more irreplaceable people. Hikaru told him he was amazing and was glad to have friends like him. He thought that maybe Katori was still waiting for him to open his heart. The day of Katori's pre-debut song came, and everyone was happy to attend in the village. Hikaru rushed to the front and sang one of Katori's songs called Bird on a Moonlit Night. Katori shed tears and joined her brother by the end of the song. Both siblings smiled earnestly to their heart's content. Katori started singing her new song and dedicated it for everyone who loved someone. It's actually a song about someone who feels so madly in love with someone else. It's like the love they share is an unconditional and safe love. Yuzuki placed her hand on her chest and felt what the song was trying to express, what her heart was trying to tell. On their way home, Yuzuki wanted to tell Tomohiko that she liked him, but found an excuse to change the topic. She wanted to learn how to ride a bicycle so that she could go anywhere with him, but she didn't have to. He just had to take her wherever she wanted to go, always with each other. Will she be able to confess her love? Things took time to turn everything beautifully. It was on summer when Tomohiko wrote a letter to his uncle in Kobe. The children would always come by and the house wasn't as empty as before because of his friends. He invited his uncle and little sister to come visit as well. Yuzuki looked happy reading a letter from Midori. However, her surprised reaction confused Tomohiko. The letter contained wonderful news that Midori was pregnant and getting married. Tomohiko looked surprised too, as her friend Yuzuki was very happy. However, her friend would be moving to Kyushu. Tomohiko encouraged her to go, but she was worried about his meals and clothes, so he decided to bring her to a village shrine dedicated to a god of easy childbirth. As they were praying for her friend, she told him to come back at the place when they would be having their own baby. This made him turn all red and excused himself. Yuzuki smiled. At the station, Yuzuki wore a very cute Hokama trousers which made her look absolutely stunning. Tomohiko complimented her as he looked away, blushing. She entrusted Ryo for his meals. Ryo wondered how she could trust her after all the nasty things she did. She thought that Yuzuki hated her because of it. Yuzuki told her that she had a sister once, but she fell ill and died before she was born. Yuzuki saw how Ryo took care of her brothers, and she wondered if her sister was still alive. She could have been so kind to her, too. She found comfort from Ryo instead. Ryo just scratched her head and accepted Yuzuki's request. However, Ryo teased her again that she might go from mistress to a full-fledged wife. Back at the train station, Yuzuki held Tomohiko's hand and told him that she would miss him. She was looking forward to meeting her friend, but not to leave him. Yuzuki leaned forward for him to kiss her. When they were about to do that, he realized what he was doing, so he slapped his face instead. Yuzuki was embarrassed, too. She told him to just forget it. He patted her head and looked away, saying that they would do plenty of that when she got back home. She blushed and promised to make him an amazing birthday feast when she went inside the train. Yuzuki arrived in Tokyo and met her friend Midori. They hugged tightly to fill in the gaps that they hadn't seen each other. She congratulated her and they both cried, still hugging one another. Midori apologized for letting her come all the way to Tokyo, but she understood and told her not to feel bad because of her delicate condition. Midori told her about being pregnant and unmarried, but her fiancé promised to make her happy, and the baby. He apologized to her relatives and offered an apology to her to visit her parents and relatives. She then asked Yuzuki about Tomohiko. Yuzuki handed out an omamori for ease of childbirth from Tomohiko when they visited a shrine to pray for Midori's pregnancy. Yuzuki assured her that Tomohiko was kind and had such an integrity. They both giggled, and Midori was happy to see that she felt safe. Midori told Yuzuki to stay in her apartment because her boyfriend would just be staying in the office. She showed her the view from the balcony, and they started singing together, just like when they were in girls' school. Within her stay, Yuzuki cooked her food, rubbed her belly, bathed, and slept together. As they lied down in bed, her friend asked her when she would get married. She told her that Tomohiko can't marry yet. Her friend asked the possibility of him not wanting to marry her. She just smiled and promised to just stay by his side always. But Midori teased her about having kids. Yuzuki screamed from embarrassment and hid under the blanket. Morning came, and as they were walking in town, Midori held her hand and told Yuzuki that she was glad to see her happy. She was finally at ease to get married without any regrets. Even though they would be living apart, she was still glad that her friend would be living a happy life. Back at the villa, as they were having a meal, Ryo teased Tomohiko about Yuzuki's return within the day. 
Tomohiko was so happy that he couldn't wait to tell her, welcome home. However, the floor started shaking. The great Kanto earthquake striked. After all the rumbling, Tomohiko went to see his neighbors. Two of his students were crying for help because their grandparents were still inside the ruined house. Suddenly, two men pushed him aside and told him that he couldn't save anybody with just one hand. Looking around, the once happy village was now in ruins. Fires were everywhere, and children were crying because of their parents and relatives being trapped inside. He realized the damage in such a tiny village and thought about its impact in Tokyo. He went home and hid himself under her coat. His mind was full of awful things that may have happened to Yuzuki while she was in Tokyo. He blamed himself because he was the one who told her to go. The damage inside the villa is just minimal compared to the other villagers' small houses. He was shivering in fear. He didn't want to be alone, and he wanted to see Yuzuki. This time, we can really tell that Yuzuki is his comfort. Suddenly, there was a noise coming from Yuzuki's room. He found Haru shivering in fear too. Then he found a letter under a folded garment. She made a knitted hand gloves and scarf for his birthday so that he wouldn't feel cold. Also, she made one for herself so they could go ride a bicycle together wearing matching scarves. At the moment, he couldn't feel his arm cold anymore. He laughed at the thought of matching scarves. He reached for the caramels she made and tasted it. He remembered how Yuzuki used to reassure her every time he thought of something bad to himself. He was used to giving up, but at that very moment, he didn't want to give up on her. She was a spring storm breezing out of the collapsing buildings and blowing out the flames. He changed his clothes and made rice balls. He was off to Tokyo to fetch her. He was so determined to make her happy. Stay tuned for the last two episodes. On his way to Tokyo, he met Ryo and the children. The damages were far more serious. Most houses collapsed or burned, and the elderly were sick and had nowhere else to go because the clinic was down as well. He decided to take Ryo, who was worried of her brother Ryotaro. He instructed the children to take the villagers to the villa for a temporary shelter. It was already nightfall when they stopped at an abandoned house and ate the rice balls that he made. Ryo noticed that he would get tough for Yuzuki's sake. Every time he thought of what it would be like in Tokyo, his heart felt like it was about to break. Ryo realized how important Yuzuki was to Tomohiko. He never treasured anyone before, but just thinking about losing someone, he could not just sit and accept things as they were. Ryo wondered how Yuzuki thought of her as her older sister. She teased him to call her a big sis too. He said he didn't want to, and she laughed about it. It was raining when they arrived in Tokyo. Every establishment and building collapsed and the only one thing still standing was the Tokyo station where everyone gathered for shelter. He panicked and kept shouting Yuzuki's name. Suddenly, someone grabbed him. It was Tamako, his younger sister. She asked him what he was doing in Tokyo. Before he could say anything, his body collapsed from exhaustion and anxiety. He woke up with his uncle Tamasuke restraining him from finding Yuzuki. It would be hard to find someone without having any leads to where he should look first. But he insisted because he knew that Yuzuki was still alive and he believed he could find her. His uncle was surprised of the changes in his and Tamako's behavior after meeting Yuzuki. His uncle wanted to meet this girl, so he wished that both the siblings would find her. Ryo and the Shima siblings parted as they looked for their loved ones. Tomohiko and Tamako looked everywhere for Yuzuki. People are screaming while posting notes on the wall hoping that their loved ones would read it. There are rumors that a lot of people got burned or drowned in Yoshiwaru so much so that they're being cremated on sight. Tomohiko heard this and thought a lot of awful things again. If Yuzuki was dead, he would die too. His sister held his hand and cried, saying that the Yuzuki she knew would never leave his brother. No matter how much she loved Yuzuki, she could never forgive her if she left his brother alone. Yuzuki and her brother must be together. Deep inside, she wanted to see her too. Tomohiko realized that his sister was just putting a brave face on all this time, but she was still very young to witness everything. He apologized for what he had said and patted her head. They were walking hand in hand again, which made his sister really happy. Suddenly, a suspicious woman was facing the river on the bridge. They grabbed her thinking that she might jump, but she apologized for the misunderstanding. She was just about to pray holding the familiar Omamuri in her hands. Tomohiko recognized it called her by her name to make sure that it was really Yuzuki's friend. The Dori recognized him too, but the thing about Yuzuki is unknown since they were separated. At the time when the earthquake happened, they were dodging fires as they ran. Midori and Yuzuki separated because a lot of people panicked. She passed out and woke up at a first aid site. She apologized for asking Yuzuki to come in Tokyo. Tamahiko just smiled and told her not to feel bad because Yuzuki was so glad to finally see her. He promised to look for her himself. While Tamako stayed with the pregnant Midori. Day and night, he never stopped looking for her. He thought that if there hadn't been a quake, he could have been eating her delicious food at home. Suddenly, he recognized a familiar voice singing. 
It was Katori. However, the ever-narcissistic Akaru appeared in front of him and explained how his twin sister wanted to lift everyone's spirit through her songs. She was having a feeding program for the people too. He told Akaru and Katori about what happened, and the siblings promised to look for her as they go all around the place. Katori gave him foods to eat on his way to find Yuzuki. He realized that it had been days since the quake happened, but his friends are in such fine spirits, and it's all because of Yuzuki. He wished that they could come home together soon. He was still hungry, but he saved the food for another day. Suddenly, a little boy grabbed the food. His little sister followed him but tripped in front of Tomohiko. The little boy gave back the food, thinking that Tomohiko would hit his sister. Tomoko, on the other hand, just gave out the food out of respect for the boy to protect his younger sister. The boy explained that they had nothing to eat after they got separated from their parents. The little girl told him that they were with another girl, but she was unable to get up. Tomohiko was thinking that it could be another child. They rushed to her so that she could receive a first aid treatment. Tomohiko was thinking that it could have been hard for three siblings to survive by themselves, but the little boy told him that the other one wasn't their sister. The little girl was even happy because of the red tie that their older sister gave to her. The little girl told him that it was Yuzuki's tie. He couldn't believe what the child said, so he rushed inside and found Yuzuki lying down unconscious. The children wondered if he was the guy named Tomohiko, because their older sister always mumbled his name. He asked the children to go over to Katori in order to receive help after they tied the scarf on his right hand to support Yuzuki. Finally, he was able to see Yuzuki alive. He cried while carrying her as he rushed back to Tokyo Station. Will Yuzuki be alive? I hope so. The setting of this episode started with Yuzuki walking on a thick pile of snow, mumbling to herself that she should go back to Tamahiko. A light flashed before her eyes, and she found herself in their old house with her mom cooking in the kitchen. As a little girl, she rushed to hug her mother and cried her heart out. Her mother told her that she should turn towards joy. However, her friend told her to settle the debts they had. Tomohiko's father fetched her from their house. He explained how she should look after his useless son. When she met Tomohiko for the first time, she wondered how much he endured his father's treatment. She saw how Tomohiko showed kindness to her despite being abandoned his whole life. She then thought about what her mother said. She smiled and told her that she was glad to meet someone who constantly surrounded her with toasty, warm feelings. She took the time to write a letter confessing her love to him, but she couldn't. Perhaps they didn't have to say those kinds of words since they would be wed eventually, but she still wanted to tell him that she loved him. And yet, they got separated. As she was walking through collapsed buildings, she saw two siblings who were crying. She tied her hair with her bow and started singing as tears rolled down her cheeks at the thought of missing him. In her subconscious, she knelt down on a thick pile of snow. She was sorry for breaking the promise to her mother that she may not be able to become the happiest woman in the world. The snow covered her whole little body and before she knew it, she heard someone calling her name. She woke up on a train and she kept running and running to have a glimpse of him. Realizing that it may be the end, she regretted not telling him her feelings. She could still hear him calling her name as she kept screaming his. She reached out for somebody and someone was able to grab her hand. In reality, Yuzuki woke up seeing Tomohiko holding her hand. He rubbed her hands on his cheeks and was glad that she woke up. She cried so hard like a child. He assured her that he would never leave her side. She cupped his cheeks and pulled him over to kiss him. All their friends, including his uncle, Tamasuke, and Tamako, were blushing out of surprise for what they saw. She then confessed that she loved him so much. He turned red and went back to his seat, awkwardly embarrassed by their friends. He told Yasuki that they weren't home yet and that there were people watching. Yasuki was even more embarrassed but it was a little too late to be mortified. Yasuki asked where they were resting. Tomohiko explained the situation that most people who needed treatment were in the first aid site in Tokyo Station. She then asked about Midori and the children she was with. Tamako assured her that her friend already reconnected with her partner and the baby was just fine. Katori also confirmed that the children were safe. Tomoko pushed her brother as she was excited to talk to Yasuki. Her uncle also introduced himself and he thanked Yasuki for taking care of his nephew. However, she hadn't met Ryo yet, so she asked about her. They were arguing about who was closer to Yasuki. Everyone else was arguing while Yasuki kept staring at Tomohiko. She was full of love when he came all the way from Chiba just for her. They both blushed and changed the subject. He gave her a rice porridge, but she just opened her mouth, a sign that she wanted him to feed her. He blew the rice porridge before giving it to her. She was still at the state of shock and realizing that she was still alive. An unexpected visitor came. It was the head of the Shima family with the oldest daughter, Tameo, grinning evilly. Their father talked to his uncle because of their younger brother getting hurt by the earthquake. Their uncle was asked to leave it all up to the other doctors to treat his other nephew back home. Things are getting more and more intense when their uncle refused to abandon all the people in the site just for his brother's own selfish reasons. Tamasuke 
told them that he is not a Shima anymore. But Tameo seemed to notice how he treated her other siblings well despite their family names. Their father asked what his dead son, Tamahiko, was doing in Tokyo. Tamasuke told him what he did just to find Yuzuki. Tamahiko already left his father behind and finally was coming into his own. Tamahiko indeed became stronger. Tamasuke wrote her brother a referral to another doctor. As they were just about to leave, Tamahiko went out and told his father that he was glad they were just fine. His father just stopped for a while and then left him with no response at all. Days passed by. They were still helping Tamasuke with his job to treat people. Seeing them with smiling faces gave them the courage to help out in their own town too. Back at the village, Tamahiko still read books to explain to his students about the world. Helping starts from showing compassion to those very close to you, and you'll end up helping the nation. This is how he explained it in the anime. The children were even more eager to lend a hand too. A month later, everything went back to normal. Yusuke, Tamako, Katori and Ryo had even gotten closer to each other. The girls were teasing Yuzuki about looking good on a wedding dress. Tamako could visualize her brother's blushing face at the thought of it. They all looked happier together, like sisters. In the spring, Tomohiko asked Hikaru to take off his glasses since they were taking a bath. However, as narcissistic as he was, Hikaru said that the glasses were already part of his beauty, and he couldn't see well if he would take it off. Tamahiko was about to go, but the children asked him not to. Back in the house, Ryo still apologized for being bad during their first meeting. She revealed that she was once bought too. She almost lost the most precious thing to her. Yuzuki told her that there was nothing to forgive in the first place because she really liked Ryo a lot. As they were laughing together, Tamako peeped from outside the door and got jealous of Ryo. The boys just got back from the spring and all the children greeted Tamahiko with a happy birthday. Yuzuki came forward and wished him as well. It might be a little late to celebrate, but everyone was working in secret just for that day. One of the children thanked him for lending the villa to those who had nowhere else to go. The villagers were bouncing back faster too. Tamahiko thanked the children for being so brave to keep their promise and taking care of the people. He was proud of Tomoko's resolve in helping other people. She became his inspiration to take actions too. He thanked Katori for giving him the courage to take the transfer exam. And he never forgot Ryo, who joined him along the uneasy road to Tokyo. He turned to Yuzuki and thanked her for being alive. She teared up a bit. Lastly, he thanked Hakuru for being his friend. Katori had never seen the smile that was on Hakuru's face before. As the anime was ending, Katori sang the song she made from Yuzuki and Tomohiko's love. The couple ended well, visiting the shrine that Yuzuki found. Yuzuki once again confessed her love for him. As for Tomohiko, he was proud of himself for being a pessimistic to a person full of life. He decided to live for others, but he should cherish her first. It finally ended with a kiss. The moral of the story is when someone's feeling hopeless, one can just get up again with the support and love from another person. Thank you for listening to Taisho Otome Fairy Tale. I hope to see you guys on the next one. Sayonara!